Okay, and we are recording, and I'm really excited to be here today with George Bell, who um, is um, is from England, and I, I, I'm excited about England because my my mom's actually from England, um, and my my dad's from the U.S. and I grew up in um, I grew up in the U.S. and and we're and we're talking about cluttering today, um, and. Um, and and the interesting thing about um, George is he really embraces his um, spoonerisms with, uh, with with cluttering and 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 before uh, before we started recording, um, what, what was what was it that you said? Um, we were talking we were talking about family, uh, which the, uh, and I was saying where my family are from, and I said you know the family of Bells who are from the Isle of Man, a place called Silverdale which uh, we were silver miners. And I was talking about my maternal grandpa, who was a Bassett. And I said that the Bassets came over and we were talking, we were talking, I called, it, I called him William the Conqueror instead of William the Conqueror. I sort of had that sort of little bit of a, which is quite funny because of course he built all the castles. And I was trying to think, how, how do I sort of get these words almost right? but not quite. I was probably thinking about the castles and sort of thinking about brickwork and I threw in a bit of concrete to go with the conqueror. I've got no idea how it works. So the words tend to, uh, tend to be associated, but not quite off the mark, you know? So yeah, it, it, it's funny. Uh, the best time to do that is actually when you're in a, in a, pub with a couple of beers and your mates and they start to laugh and we were talking about other silly things that uh, happen is how you can sort of miss the point of a conversation and go off on on detours and we were talking about sort of all, all the all, all the usual stuff that happens and just before we switched on to live video uh I was talking. Well, we, I was talking about what I would call the the sub clutterers, which are the people who have individual aspects of it, but you don't actually quite have the full Monty, uh, which is a film in England. You know, if if you ever heard of the full Monty. Yeah, yeah, I've, um, I, th um, I think I, I, I think I watched that. That had a bunch of superstars in it, right? Uh, basically, miners had all lost their job, and so they decided to become a, uh, a sort of male st stripping group. And the full Monty is sort of about taking off all your clothes, but it was basically it was a empowerment film about people trying to make a make a living, you know. So yeah, it was it, it was a funny it was a funny film, but uh, I suppose what it is 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 it's the complete the complete spectrum of cluttering, and the people who have aspects of it, but maybe are maybe don't show every single aspect. Uh, my cluttering is my cluttering, which I'm told doesn't quite meet the full definition. I don't have an awful lot of fast speech in general social situations, but if I'm really anxious, the speed of my speech goes absolutely through the roof and there's a dysregulation there. Uh, and I tend to maze, I tend to lose control of my speech. Uh, with friends, then there's the word slips. And then there's that sort of prolongation uh, that sort of that, that sort of happens when I'm when I'm trying to find words, and so I've got all of that mixed in. But they, you know, it's like I I can keep three balls in the air but lose one, or or, or four balls in the air and lose one. So they're not always always displayed all at the same time, which is quite weird. I've read a lot about uh, cluttered speech. I've read about the links with ADHD. Uh, I've read about the links with autism. 
uh, what else have I done? Uh, links with uh, dyslexia as well. Uh, I've got a very good friend of mine who I work with who's dyslexic and when she has to give a public address she'll maze terribly and speak incredibly fast because she's nervous. Uh, I've got another lady I know who the first time I met her came out with two not quite sort of mispronunciations but sort of almost the insertion of extra extra letters or sort of sounds in the word and I picked up on this quite a, quite quite a way I was going to say then quite quite quickly straight away so that was another one that almost came out if you understand I was going to say straight away and quite quickly and it turned into quite away you know it, it's, it's just the way it is and anyway I heard that and I thought oh that's unusual haven't heard that before I'll give her, I'll give her the nth degree so I said well you know I've got this uh, autism and I've got this uh, strange speech disorder I said I noticed you sort of messed up your words I said you've got any body in your family with uh, any type of sort of learning difficulty like ADH or autism or any of the other things and she sort of said well yeah my daughter actually has got uh, ADHD you know and you know we wonder whether there's a bit of autism there as well and she sort of you know likes to keep all her room tidy and I said well that's funny because I live like a little bit a little bit of a pig I know where everything is but it's all up in the air you know I need one of I I, 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 I need I need somebody to tell me what to do you can about you can you, 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 you can imagine I know where everything is but if you walked in nobody else would if that makes sense yeah you know, yeah, yeah. You know I noticed you've got a very neat filing cabinet behind you and then somehow something's got a little a little bit wrong and you've got some sort of horizontal stuff there but my dare say that you know where everything Everything, everything is in that filing cabinet, you know, <laughs> or <laughs> bookcase. You know. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, so, so this is probably uh, well, well. It's just to make it's just to make it look like I'm um, I'm organized. Um, it, it, if I show you the rest of my house, then it um, it's it doesn't it doesn't really look uh, very very organized. Yeah. Have you got any it, special um, interests? Um. You, um, you, you mean uh, um, as far as cluttering or like like my special interest in general? Yeah, in, in general, when you're not when you're not doing this. Oh, I um, so uh, so so I also I, I also probably have um, autism. I'm 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 self-diagnosed with, uh, with with that. I'm um, one of my uh, one of my interests though is is dyslexia because I think uh, for. Um, all the people that I've met with this dyslexia are really interesting, and I've never actually met anyone with dyslexia that doesn't have um, pretty close to perfect speech. And um, and so um, and so w whenever I um, like like in ways people with dyslexia are kind of on the other uh, on the other side of things that um, that, that, that I am. Uh, like my let, my son has dyslexia, and he uh, had what he had what's called phonetic based dyslexia. He was slow learning how to speak, but he's much better, you know, for want of a better word, he's what I would call street and person savvy. He's quite popular. Uh, he's not, he, he's tremendously well organized and he shows no features. None of my family show any features of cluttered speech, but all three of my boys have had some type of uh communication disorder uh so i've got one older one older son who's got a law degree uh he could speak just before the age of four and he's got a diagnosis of high high functioning autism stroke asperger's uh but he's not uh i've got another son who had more classical autism and he is visually savant absolutely phenomenal 
you know, at a uh, very young age, sort of six, he could put a jigsaw puzzle together using both hands at high speed. Uh, and he could do it with Greyside facing him, you know? He's, how the hell could he do that? I often think if you could train somebody like that, he'd make a great surgeon, uh, you know? How the hell could you do that? And uh, then my other son is in, didn't speak until about the age of four. And even then he needed quite a lot of speech and language therapy. So quite, fa quite fascinating. My wife has got a brother who's probably got autism. Her sister has uh, got an autistic son. Uh, and we, we, you know, we just accept it. It's the way our family is, you know? It's, you know, uh, I had quite a rough time with my uh, speech disorder. We had. Oh, and, a, um, and before we um, before we move on, I have a I have a question. Um, so so I was talking to I was talking to Kathy um, Kathy Scaler Scott, and yeah. um, and and we're, um, she's um, she's kind of an expert on on autism and um, and also on cluttering, and. Um, and I, and I asked her I asked her the question of uh, well obviously uh, obvious, obviously cluttering and autism can um, can coexist yeah. um, and I always say that you can have cluttering with um, uh, with autism and you can have cluttering without autism but um, but but I don't actually know that because like um, I I'm I, I think I'm pretty good at being able to like tell if someone has cluttering but. It's, uh, but with some people, it's really, really hard to tell if they have um, autism. With, uh, with some people, it's really easy. Um, so, so I asked Kathy. Um, I asked Kathy. So, so um, can you have cluttering with without autism? And um, and she said, well, well, I don't know. But um, but then she uh, then she explained that because she is uh, because she's a researcher, then uh, and and like. Like I can, I, I can casually throw out, oh well, I think that person has um, cluttering. Oh, I think that person has autism, uh, because because I'm not a I'm not a professor, I'm not a researcher, I'm not going to get um, my uh, my books voided at the library or whatever um, if I if I make the wrong call. But uh, but 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 she was explaining that uh, she was explaining ju just how difficult it would be to prove that you can have cluttering and not have autism because you basically need someone who's um, both a speech pathologist. And a um, and 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 able to diagnose someone with autism and um, and go through all of that. So um, so so in order to actually do that, um, th um, this person would have to go through like like, like a person would have to go through like uh, weeks and weeks of tests and and, and whatever. Um, and so uh, well, from, and so, like, from various different disciplines and yeah, you then be uh, yeah, talking, yeah. And so, talking um, and about so, a functional assessment. So you probably yeah. need to see. Uh, <laughs> An ed, ed psych, uh, occupational uh, therapist who would have to assess uh, motor and uh, sensory and organisational issues. Mm -hmm. You'd have to see uh, the ed psych would probably have to do some very basic uh, stuff with sort of sequencing and maybe a Vexler test. I had my IQ done and it came out at 137, which was pretty bloody weird. But what was even more weird was the span on it. And the highest bit on the VEXA test went to 148, which is as high as that one went. And that was easy. But the lowest bits were 110, which is a little better than average, but it's sort of every other guy on the street. Uh, so you sort of get something like that, and that sort of then explains why there were certain things I could do really easily, and other stuff which I was finding really difficult. And you sort of get to get, get into that, and you, you you sort of start to you you start you sort of start to think. And there seems to be two different, shall we say, personal views on the links between. Uh, cluttering and uh, learning difficulties or, 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 or difference, neuro, neuro differences. I don't really think they should be called uh, learning difficulties, neural differences. So having spoken to David Ward and I've spent a fair bit of time with him, uh, uh, 
with diagnosis. He he seems to think it's as associated with ADHD, uh, and I think he's going for the for the speed of speech. Apparently, some what are they called some definitions of cluttering. You've got to automatically have fast speech, either some of the time or all of the time and all the rest of it. And listening to you, I know damn well that you don't speak. You tend to don't speak. But that's wrong. Don't speak quickly or incredibly fast. Yet other people sort of say, oh, well, it's too fast for words. So then you sort of get into, well, where where do the boundaries lie? And I think, you know, I definitely maze. I definitely uh, get my words a little bit mixed up. I definitely have the odd interjection. And this is this is the stuff that I'm practiced at, practiced at saying, you know. Uh, but my fast speech only comes out when I'm really, really, really nervous. So where where do the boundaries lie? Uh, are they sort of so definite? Uh, because according to David, some people will only show one or two little bits of it. So they're sort of, you know, not quite clutterers, but they can be sort of considered within the group. So where where do the boundaries lie? And I know, who's that uh, nice uh, Dutch chappy? I always forget his name. Something like... Oh, yeah, um, Red, um, Redger Wilhelm. Yeah. He's he he's got a little bit of a stutter uh, to go with his his uh, communication disorder. You speak to David Ward, and he sort of got you know he's sort of been sort of diagnosed with cluttering, but he has, only seems to show fast speech when he's lecturing. So we have we have this. I think with diagnosis, it needs to be. I think there's a situational thing to do with cluttering, which I I, I find I find fast I find f fascinating. So we've got all of the all, all of this stuff uh, going on. I was also uh, on the group talking to somebody from Tunisia. Now I've been to Tunisia. You, you know, there's nothing more I like better than a Tunisian brick which is a sort of weird sandwich they have over there. And uh, he was saying that he clutters in Arabic, but when uh, he's speaking some of the other languages that they use in Tunisia, i.e. French and English, his speech doesn't clutter, because probably because he's having to select his words more, more carefully. So yeah. it's... How would I best put it? Maybe there's a bit of cluttering that's like riding a bicycle. So, in other words, you 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 could you could you you clutter when you're doing something that's you're communicating in your mother tongue. It's automatic. Whereas maybe if you're using another language, you don't clutter as much. Uh, and my guess is because I've heard that you speak Thai, don't you? Um, I am. I'm learning Thai. I. I... I speak um, I speak Thai a little bit, but not um, um, not, uh, not enough um, not, uh, not enough where I could um, like list it on my resume or anything. All oh, right. Well, uh, my sister's child lives in Thailand, and she speaks oh, yeah. she, she speaks quite good Thai. So, and she hasn't got cluttering. But I was wondering I was wondering whether you clutter in Thai. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I was uh, I, I was actually getting a, a massage today, and and my uh, my tie is not uh, my tie is not really um, well. My tie is not really great, but um, but but I was um, and and I've never like like today is the first time that I noticed um, cluttered speech in Thai uh, because usually I'm just saying like really short things. Um, yeah. That, uh, I, Stop um, phrases. Or, yeah, yeah, um, and um, and and I was getting um, I was getting a massage today, and and um, she was doing this like thing where she was hitting my collarbone, and 
Um, and, and, um, and, and, and Thai people are really, really intuitive. Um, and so, so she could tell, like she, she could tell I didn't like what she was doing. And, um, and, and I don't know what, I, I don't know where the word for collarbone, but I know the word for, uh, for bone, which is um, ga, um, gaduk and, or, or um, graduk. Um, if, um, if you're, um, your, your niece probably speaks really, really good Thai. Um, they, they kind of drop the R in, in graduk and just say gaduk. So, so I was trying to remember the, um, the word for bone um, um, because she was like hitting my, uh, like, like doing this shoulder, shoulder thing and just hitting my bone. And, and, um, and she asked me, um, she asked me if I was in pain and I said, um, and I said, no. Um, and I, I was trying to, I was trying to, um, think of the word um, gaduk, and I said ga ga ga, and then she said, um, and, uh, and then she realized what I was saying. She and she said gaduk about the same time uh, about the yeah. same time. I, uh, uh, but uh, but but that where I where I basically repeated um, ga ga ga, uh, and, and it was kind of just well, that was that was interesting because one was a ga, and the other was a ga. Is it a ga or a ga? Oh, it's it, it's ga. All right. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, um, just uh, like that's a uh, that's a that's a common mistake that English um, English speakers use because like the uh sound is super super it's like the most common uh, it's the most common phoneme in in English where mm -hmm. uh, where, where Thai kind of has that um, but uh, but 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 it's a super super rare sound um, and so um, and, um, and so the, the, um, the English the English translate all foreign languages into English, but use the same spelling. So our okay. pronunciation is often terrible. Yeah, and, um, and there's, a, um, there, um, there's a town, um, there's a town outside of Bangkok, it's called, uh, well, the Thai way to say it is um, pa Pattaya. And let's um, not call it Pattaya. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, there's, actually, there's actually two different, um, two different wrong, um, pronunciation. One is one is Pattaya, and the other is Pattaya. All oh, right. But, um, but it's but it's Pattaya. Yeah. Is is how you say it, and, and I'm getting the tones wrong because I I'm really bad at Thai tones. But um, but 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 the sounds are Pattaya. Um, uh, but 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 yeah, like um, everyone everyone calls it the wrong uh, the wrong thing. Oh, um, so so going back to David Ward, I um, I actually have his book right right on my table. Um, this, um, that must be the new one. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's, um, it's the one, um, um he, uh, I think he wrote a chapter in it. It's the one he did with, Ka uh, with Kathy Scaler or Scott. Right. And, um, and, and it's a, it, it's a collection of like 20 different research papers on, on mm. cluttering with a whole bunch of different people. So, um, so, so he's, um, he, he's just really cool, but I don't really know much about him and that's, and, and I didn't. I, I didn't actually know that he uh, he's in England unless he was like a visiting professor. So, so uh, uh, no, he's uh, what do you call? It? He's an uh, an associate professor, but he's got a PhD. So he's a Dr. David Ward, uh, and he's in charge of research at Reading University in the language school there. Oh, cool! And and he has um, he has cluttering, or he, um, he just yeah yeah he he he, he has. And uh, what do you call it? Some of the tests we did, we did a word finding test, uh, which was quite good fun. Because I used to, typical autistic, yeah, I went through my usual obsessions when I was tiny. So I, I did the dinosaurs, I did the Second World War, and I also did animals. And because we had a lot of, uh, you know, I went through butterflies as well. Uh, not that interested in moths, but I was definitely interested in butterflies. Uh, and so we, we had some uh, word finding thing for different types of animals. And I used to have all the observers nature books. And of course, I was just able to reel stuff off off the top of my head really, really quickly. And then we were sort of doing other different things. And he was sort of busy there shaking his head saying, oh, well, you know, you're you sort of equaled some of my PhD students. And I said, well, that's all very interesting. He said, but you, you're right. He said, you do sort of do, do the odd er and um uh, when you're doing that. And I said, well, yeah, that's the sort of, that's the sort of thing. And then we did the limerick test, uh, which was great fun uh, because of course, 
when I was really, really young, I'd have run all of those words absolutely smoothly into almost one what one continuous stream. Uh, and anyway, try to do limericks. I could do the limericks, but because of the Mickey taking that used to take that used to happen when I was younger. You know, he was getting me to go faster and faster and faster. And I do something called segmentation, uh, where I was deliberately sort of making the T's and at the end of each word deliberately hard to separate it from the next one so that I wouldn't. And what I'd effectively done, and I can even remember practicing limericks when I was a kiddie, I'd effectively given myself my own speech therapy. To, to avoid the phenomena of the speech all sort of turning into one one entire word, which was quite which was quite funny, because you know I'd obviously been aware at a young age that there were some things I could do and some things that I couldn't. Uh, so in other words, what I'd always try to do is deal with any difficulties that I had. By practicing, you know, and that's that, that's quite it. That that's quite it. That that's quite interesting, really. So, you know, it it, it was just it was just some of the uh, work that we did together. So, and of course, needless to say, I also brought brought in my uh, book uh, because what I thought I'd do is when you mix up a word. You leave it behind you, and you get on with your life. It's not a big, not a, not a big deal. Uh, but I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll actually record each one of these words that I mix up, as I, you know, just throughout the normal working day, and you know, various other things. And I sort of had a book of them, which was quite, which was quite. Uh, Quite amusing, and he looked at it. Oh, that's cluttering. And then, of course, he decided since I didn't often show fast speech, it couldn't. It, it wasn't cluttering. It was disfluency. So you sort of have that. You know, where are the boundaries, for want of a better word? You know, you know, at you know, at what at what point are you? At what point are you black? You know, a full blown clutterer. At what point are you sort of grey? Sort of somewhere in the fringes, sort of three out of three out of four. And at what point do you only exhibit a sort of one or two of the features? It's quite an interesting. That's quite an interesting concept in itself. Uh, so yeah, it, it 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 it's fascinating. I think there's a little bit more to cluttering than just the cluttering itself. I think. Uh, There's a is there's an interweave with other disorders, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's fascinating. So yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it 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 does. And um, one of the um, one one of the big things that I wanted to talk about is is could you um, could you talk about like your uh, your childhood, your speech in childhood, and then um, and then how um, how you got um, how you got diagnosed and just um, basically kind of your journey to um, from um, from when you were a kid to um, to to figuring out that you have cluttering. As a young child, uh, people noticed I was a bit of an oddball. You know, I had the uh, the dinosaur fetish uh, and all the rest of it. I was slow learning to read, but I could remember a lot of things. Uh, we used to have a fruit and fruit and fruit veg, and a mobile shop used to come round to our village in rural Wiltshire in the uh, mid sixties, mid sixties, sort of late sixties onwards. Uh, the chap was a greengrocer, and I could remember his name years later. But he, he he was called Roy, and he nick, he nicknamed me the Little Professor. So you had that sort of you know, and that was that's that that sort of comment is often applied to kids with Aspergers who get in get into 
get into sort of learning sort of weird and wonderful uh, things and facts. And I got a bit of a, a, I had a bit of a science fetish as well, sort of Jack Cousteau and, you know, I will learn how everything works and will become sort of, you know, a really cool scientist, you know, I sort of got sort of, you know, there was sort of NASA and the, uh, the uh, moon mission. And I can remember, remember that on the black and white TV, you know, and you know, how, it, how does everything, how does everything work? And the sixties was a weird time. Because of course science was going quite quickly, and at the same time, it's only twenty years after the Second World War, which was really all piston engines and all the rest of it. And of course, the Second World War uh, drove forward computing uh, with Turing and all the rest of it. So you had this you had this sort of uh, massive uh, technical technological explosion happening in the sort of 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s uh, and the advance of science, which of course I was I was sort of really interested in that. Uh, I went through a whole load of different things when I was a kiddie. I went through the, uh, I think I've already mentioned it, the, butterf the, 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 the butterfly, the science, you know, uh, what else? His history for a little while, dinosaurs, uh, Second World War, uh, was a, a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a thing of mine, uh, and then it was sort of you know as I sort of did more work at uh, secondary school, you sort of you sort of learn the syllabus, uh, and I still know some of my teachers from secondary school, courtesy of Facebook, uh, and you know that sort of you sort of you know I can put myself right back in the classroom right back in each individual lesson and it's a very strange thing i'm not sure how well your memory works with your childhood but you know i can sort you know i can sort of remember decimalization in the uk and also all sorts of silly things from my childhood and it it, it, it it's it's fascinating i was always a a little bit of an oddball child you know i'd be sort of on the edge of the crowd. Uh, got bullied a little bit at school, possibly because I was a little bit of an oddball. Uh, that happens to quite a lot of people with uh, autism at school. But yeah, I, I, I survived school and I survived, survived college. Uh, wasn't very organized. I find going to all the different rooms and lectures quite complicated. But I, I had a, I had a sneaky plan on that because what I did is I had one or two good friends, and when they all went to skiing in the first year, I attended every single lecture, took the notes, photocopied them, and so when they came back, uh, term time, what what they did is uh, six of them all had a a file given to them with my notes, and you know nothing nothing missed out so they could catch up catch up with the lecture notes so and then of course it was a little bit scratch my back scratch your back and they were then able to uh, do the same for me later on during the, later on during the course so that was that, that that was good you know you sort of uh, have techniques to cope with your disorganization what you do is you use the strength of your friends <laughs> so yeah uh, and that's quite a, it's quite a good technique. Uh, so then, of course, there was uh, uh, my wife, and we had the had the children with autism. You think that's a bit strange. Why are they lining things up? Why don't they speak? And stuff like that. And you you, you know you can't you know can't can't quite uh, work that out. You know, there's something different. But you don't know what it is, uh, so and we were very, very lucky. We got a very good speech and language therapist, and I've got computer-assisted learning, and uh, Microsoft gave us the dinosaur Barney, uh, which used to sort of talk to you and would sort of go with your computer, and you know that. that you know, the kids have got A levels and uh, O levels and degrees, and one of them drives. 
so yeah, it's you know one of one of them moves with his girlfriend in his house, uh, away from mum. You know the youngest child has got dyslexia, uh, and uh, we sort of you know we, in case you hadn't gathered, I sort of developed certain sort of uh, interests, and so we uh, we we spent once spent four hours sitting down just watching. Uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, the not 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 it was it it wasn't Macbeth. It was Hamlet. So you know we had all the uh, we, we 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 had the David Tennant version, and we had the always forget his name played Mad Max. Who played Mad Max? The Australian actor. So we 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 spent a whole a, a, a whole afternoon watching this watching the same play, but but with two uh, produced in two different ways, you know, and sort of doing silly th silly things like that. So so that that that's quite good. that's quite good fun. Just sort sort of swapping ideas with the kids, you know, because each one of my children has got various things that they're particularly interested in. So it's almost as if they've distilled. Or, or little bits of the things that I'm interested in and taking them with me. I often wonder how much of our choice is what we actually want to do and how much of our interests, of course, we've either shared it with other people or and how much is sort of passed on genetically. In other words, we're almost sort of programmed to do certain things because of our genetics, you know, it's, uh, you know, it amuses me that uh, she's got, got a silver, silver miners on the Isle of Man. And I sort of ended up doing a, 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 a manual sort of job, even though it involved a little bit of, a little bit of surgery, i.e. like dentistry. So I'm sort of, you know, taking out amalgam fillings and doing things like that. So you have these silver miners who are taking bits of silver out of rock and then you have me sort of like messing around with teeth. It's sort of quite fascinating, really. You know, uh, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You said your mum came from England, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. She's um, she's from Durham County, and my, uh, my 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 family's still up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Durham Castle and Durham University, beautiful part of the world, by the way. You know. Yeah, I I only went there once when I was uh, when I was like two or three years old, so I I don't really remember any of it. Uh, I would have thought the climate's a little different from Thailand, but uh, you might you 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 might want to visit and read about it on the net. I've got no doubt that you sort of you know you sort of uh, do do various various things, being a bit of a computer boffin, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, so 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 I wanted to um, I, um, I wanted to go back to your uh, back to your diagnosis. So so did David did David Ward diagnose you, and then and then how did you meet David David Ward? Well, that's a long story. We got into a big scrap over the care of my children. Uh, I pay for their speech and language therapy, and then the health service sort of came in. Uh, and the education authorities and tried to uh, tell us what was correct for our children. The speech therapist I used was a lady called Sandy Burback, who worked in South Africa with a lot of autistic children and then transferred to the UK and worked at Eddington and Shatbrick, where she's sort of, she's currently writing her PhD, works for the University of Bristol. Uh, and sort of went sideways into dyslexia and sort of noticed that some of the dyslexic, a lot of people with autism also have dyslexia and vice versa. Uh, and I've sort of got some dyslexic features, but I'm more dyslexic when I'm typing than when I'm uh, writing, because I've almost remembered the shape of the words, if that makes sense. Uh, so, yeah, we got into a fight over that. When I was discussing things with the authority, and obviously I was extremely worried about my children's future, 
uh, went, uh, got a diagnosis of autism, which explained my differences, but I never realized what the uh, speech, I wondered sort of, you know, I knew that my speech changed a bit under extreme stress, but I couldn't make out what it was. So anyway, wind it, few of, wind it forward a few years and uh, I got left with PTSD after the fight over my children. And of course, what happens is when you get yourself into similar situations, it brings up all the stuff from the past. You feel different and your speech changes. So I didn't feel good with PTSD. I went for therapy. And when I was talking about things, obviously my speech changed uh, because I was revisiting the emotions. So I had to see a consultant, you know. So I saw a consultant who diagnosed something called, which he called cyclothymia with good prognosis. Now, cyclothymia is a terrible, it's, it's uh, the lowest form of bipolar, but it relapses in about 60% of cases to bipolar. So when I needed help later and I went for help and my speech was going fast, they wanted to lock me up. You know, it must be bipolar. I thought, well, I know my speech is different, but what the hell's happening? So anyway, after after getting out of getting out of that, and a little bit of a, a, a scrap with the local authorities over over that, I thought, what the hell's happening? You know, right? I need to take charge of this, and I sort of remembered what various people had said to me and the looks they'd given me when I was speaking about the things that had upset me, you know. Uh, so I thought, right, I need to research this, you know. So I thought, I know what I'll do. Well, fast speech autism, rapid speech autism, rapid speech Asperger's, fast speech Asperger's. And of course, needless to say, I came across Kathleen Scaler Scott, went down her list. I thought, amazing, you know, fast speech interjections, uh, spoonerisms. I thought, oh my God, that's me. And then because of also, also because I'm interested in lots of different things, needless to say, I thought, oh my God, if you mazed and you were speaking quickly and you were having trouble organizing your speech under certain circumstances, that could be diagnosed but so, sorry, mixed up with or diagnosed as bipolar, even though your sleep patterns wouldn't mix, wouldn't uh, fit, and even though there was no, uh, what, do, what do they call it, uh, flight of ideas, which you get in bipolar. And I thought, oh my God. And I know psychiatrists don't do speech, and speech and fat language, I almost mixed it up again. I almost said speech and language instead of language therapists don't uh, don't mix very much with psychiatrists. I thought I've read there's a high incidence of bipolar in autism. Uh, I know that people with autism get a lot more anxious about things. I thought, oh my God, have I found something out? Have I worked something out here? Is it really important? So I thought, I know what I need to do. I need to go back to the speech and language professor I had the argument with uh, over the care of my children. Nice lady called Professor Sue Rolston, works from uh, University of Bristol. Sandy's now working with her. So anyway, got in contact with Sue Rolston and I said, well, you know this stuff you said about my children? Well, we know that there's papers now. She said, yeah, well, I was wrong. And I said, well, you're really brave admitting that. I said, you'd be glad to know you didn't do any major harm to my children. I said, I got left with a bit of PTSD. I said, but I've got this uh, communication disorder. Uh, I think it's cluttering. I said, do you know a UK expert on cluttering? So she introduced me. I said, well, uh, she uh, gave me David Ward's email address. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So I introduced Dr. David Ward to uh, Professor Digby Tantum, and we did a few tests. And uh, I think off camera, you have to give me your email. 
uh, but you'll be there to know that the cluttered speech or clut speech cluttering or cluttered speech is now recognized by the Royal College of Psychiatrists and it's included in their, their sort of stuff about autism. Because the thing is, it's that with, if you ask somebody with cluttered speech, how does this relate to that? They'll be able to, they'll be able to tell you, you know, they'll know the steps in between where they've missed stuff out, where stuff wasn't too well organized. Whereas a person with bipolar, because there's psychosis there, they can't do that because there is genuine flight of ideas. And it's a really important diagnostic tool when you're dealing with people uh, with bipolar or uh, any type of psychosis uh, to have a properly structured interview. Because you can imagine in a, when I'm being, when a, if I'm in an interview where it's not really well organized, I can go off tangentially and all sorts of things. So hopefully I've helped a lot of people out. I've spoken to uh, Kathy Scaler Scott, and she called me a bit of a thinker, you know. But I, I sort of live, but I reflect a lot, if that makes sense. I think about things, you know. And uh, I suppose that's my little my little contribution. I've read David's book. I took his, uh, what do you call it? He's got, he's got quite an interesting table in his book, uh, which uh, if you give you if you give me your email address offline, what I'll do is I'll scan it and I'll send it to you. And I, I looked at his table. And obviously because I've read a lot about, uh, special educational needs, uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and all the rest of it. I, I sort of looked at his table and I started to think, hmm, I can see features of dyslexia and organizational dyspraxia and other things here. Uh, I notice that you often wear quite soft clothing, and I do as well. I really like cotton, and I don't like sort of scratchy clothes, as I call them. Uh, and I'm the person who, who you know, I can, I really notice the textures on my foods, and you know, I uh, don't like polyester. Poly, yeah, you know, my my sheets have got to be cotton, you know. And my jeans have got to be old jeans with holes in, you know, practically with holes in. My jeans are just getting comfortable when the legs fall off them, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, my God, I put my jeans on. And, oh, my God, I need to take them off. I need to sort of get one of my three-year-old sets of jeans, you know. It's sort, of, it's sort of really peculiar, you know. It's sort of, you know, I'll always be a, bit, a little bit scruffy. And I find it fascinating. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, do you find do you find uh, that you have any sensory issues or not? Um, yeah. So uh, smells, um, smells are are probably the worst for me. Um, and uh, li uh, like uh, li like any kind of strong smells, like like I think even even smells that I like. Um, yeah. just, um, just just like um, that's uh, that's probably the that's probably the biggest thing. But uh, but but kind of going back to what you're saying about about jeans, I'm I, I'm 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 the same way. And and the really cool thing about living in Thailand is uh, they, um, they have uh, like 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 about 500 meters this way and about 200 meters this way. Uh, there are these ladies that ladies that like sit on the street and will sew clothes and they'll and they'll basically do any kind of repair for only a dollar. Ah. <laughs> Um, and so, so, so the cool thing is that the, the, the jeans that I have, um, like no matter how much they fall apart, uh, like, like I just kind of wait for them to fall apart. Then I then I take them to the lady and say, hey, um, hey, hey, stitch this back together so I so it doesn't have holes in the wrong, um, it, 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 in the in, in the wrong places. So, 
Um, so, so that's a that's a really really cool thing about living in Thailand. Because um, like in the in the U.S. to get someone to repair your jeans, it, it's it's just about as expensive as like getting a new pair of jeans. So, uh, yeah. so um, where where with any uh, with, with even like complex repairs, then uh, th then she she still basically charged as a dollar for it. So um, so um, so so basically, I'm set for like as long as I live in Thailand, I I don't have to buy new jeans. So um, so so I'm. I'm a little bit um, I'm a little bit similar to you um, um, to you with that with that. So, but, but um, look so on the advantage. That's 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 going to be the latest green revolution because in the UK uh, we started to oh, started to get in, into sort of you know you can buy these sort of cheap clothes and all the rest of it. So you should never be seen on the internet with the same thing twice and. I think my oldest T-shirts are 17 years old. <laughs> yeah, I, I know which shop I got them from, uh, and I know why I picked them. And you know, they're now sort of they're now sort of getting, but that that sort of material went out of fashion, came into fashion, and has gone out of fashion, if that makes sense. So the trouble is, of course, is the colours fade a little bit, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it, it, it it's fascinating. I'll have to send you uh, the extracts from David's book sometime, and that would be really fun. So. Oh yeah, yeah, that, uh, that would be that, that would be interesting. Oh, um, one of the things I want to go back to is is spoonerisms because uh, uh, because I've, I, I've talked to a lot of people about cluttering, but we, um, and, and like in pretty much every book about cluttering, they mention spoonerisms, but, but, but you're actually the first, uh, you're actually the first cluttering interview that I've done where we've talked about spoonerisms very much. And, um, and, and I really like, um, I really like your approach and, um, um, uh, basically, uh, basically the spoonerisms are funny, which, uh, which, which they are and and like like embracing your spoonerisms rather than uh, um, well, well there's so much uh, there's so much about like like you get diagnosed with a, with a speech problem then you feel uh, well well then uh, then like with me I felt I, I felt like sad and depressed until I figured okay well I can work on this um, and so uh, and so uh, and so I kind of see like embracing spoonerisms as as being as being kind of like a level five or level ten or um, um, thing, um, thing that like like people wouldn't normally think to do that like like initially like right after diagnosis, but but uh, uh, but, but it is a it is a really funny thing and really um, it, and I think a really um, healthy way of uh, really healthy way of looking at things. I listen to your speech and it interests me because you often extend your words. Uh, where I've got quite a few of these uh, interjections and I do those little funny little extensions as I call them uh, but in a way what happens is when you're doing that people ain't going to interrupt you so and you're sort of collecting your thoughts and what you say is often really valid and you know how would I best put it what I call you know I would be really interested to sort of, you know, just to sit down, have a beer, listen, talk, 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 talk the tosh that normal people talk uh, about all sorts of silly things, uh, and ideas and lived experiences and sort of stuff like that. And I feel sure that your, again, your speech would probably uh, change uh, a lot of people know me know me because I can I can come out with some quite uh, sort of funny comments quite quickly uh, and to a certain extent I word word associate as well uh, so it, 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 it's it's it, it's quite it's quite fascinating uh, and thinking thinking totally off the ball again because it was that again the uh, the funny words uh, we used to have uh, what are they called Not Morecambe and Rice. Oh, who is he called? Oh, I forget his name. We used to have uh, two Ronnies, that was it. We used to have the uh, two Ronnies in the UK who were comedians. 
uh, uh, and one of the funny things he used, what their writers used to do, or either he did, was he they they used to sort of have sort of verbal humour where they'd sort of get their words just a little bit muddled up, uh, and it was almost uh, uh, what's he called, Ronnie. Yeah, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie uh, Barker, that was it. And I used to watch him speaking and his face, and his face didn't move very much. Uh, very, very nice man. Uh, and he sort of, sort of wondered whether, whether he uh, might have a, a, a touch of spectrum in him. You know, I love I love the word spectrum because I, I started to say uh, autistic spectrum disorder because I used to say I started to say it like spectra uh, from the James Bond film. You know, ah, you know how evil you are. Ah, he's spectra, sort of stroke your invisible cat. Uh, you know, uh, and you sort of you, you sort of look. I think the world's a wonderful place, and I think we've got all different countries and all different people, and. I think having a, a minor uh, speech disorder, you know, yes, people might look at you a little bit differently sometimes, but I don't think it makes you into, I think it's part of a continuum of humanity, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's anything to get over fussed about. I think under certain circumstances, it can cause some difficulties. Uh, and hopefully I've helped unravel that a little bit. But that was based on my lived experience. I wish I hadn't have uh, the difficulties I'd got into. Uh, but if it helps other people, that's great, you know? I was interested in helping my children. You know, I love watching your videos uh, and, you know, listening to you thinking and watching you people, watching, get it all right, but right, not watching you people, watching you try to help people, not watching you people. You know, there, there you go again, doing it again, George. <laughs> you know, try, watching you try to help people, I, you know, and I, I, I look at that and I, I sort of, you know, take, take some little notes and sort of think, yeah, 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 you know, you, you, you're doing a good job there, Joseph, you know, <laughs> thanks. Well, um, thanks, um, thanks, very um, thanks very much. That's a really nice, um, that's a really nice compliment. So, um, so, um, so, so one, uh, one question I have is, is like, um, what, what do you think are some of the positive things about about cluttering or um, uh, like, like like we talk uh, we talk a lot about uh, um, we, we talk a lot about like the or or, or, or um, but, uh, like a lot of the researchers talk about talk, talk about like the negative things about cluttering but um, but but I always think that there's always a positive and a neg and a negative to to everything. Um, and so, so, so I'm wondering what uh, what do you think are some of the positive things about um, cluttering? You, uh, you, you mentioned like spoonerisms and and um, and humor. Uh, what are some of the other things that are are positives associated with um, cluttering with speech? I think that uh, a lot of us actually, you know, we. We're not necessarily the average run of the mill people, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, I don't have, I, I don't have two and a half children. I have, I, I have three. I have a a, reason, a reasonable IQ. Uh, yeah, I want to change the world to make it better for people, which is, you know, how I joined the cluttering group. Uh, you know. And I, I sort of say silly things as well, you know, 
Uh, obviously, the group was set up by, I think it was set up by Sister Mary Nolan, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I always sort of, and I know I shouldn't do it, I always joke j joke uh, about about my internet it my internet uh girlfriend sister mary you know and stuff like that uh you know i know it's a little bit of, uh, irreverent but i i think we're uh, i think we're a very broad church i think we've got a lot of interesting people and i think we have a whole multiplicity of talents and I think that the cluttering isn't our actual primary thing. Yeah, I think the thing that's uh, really interesting about us are the assorted uh, specialisms and special interests and all the rest of it. I think the humour is great you know i think that's i i i you know the spoonerisms i really embrace you know it's sort of you're sort of sitting there and you're talking and then all of a sudden this sort of weird word comes out and everybody sort of sort of sort of laughs a little bit and everybody knows what you're trying to say you just ignore it so you, it's, it's not a big it's not a big thing uh the fact is is that we exist that we're a very broad, broad church and all the rest of it. And I don't think anybody should pick on anybody else. You shouldn't, you know, there's a lot of things that have changed over the years. I mean, you know, people don't pick on transgender people. They don't pick on people for being black or anything like that anymore, you know, and that's a good thing or, or you know, having physical difficulties or or learning difficulties. I don't pick on people for that. Uh, and I don't think people should pick on people because they have a stutter or because they, they speak slightly differently. It's not how you say it, it's what you've got to say that's the important thing. And I think people should be free just to be just 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 to be accepted and if people need a little bit of a hand with something because they've got a particular uh, learning difficulty or something like that they should always get the help the help they need uh, you shouldn't uh, you, you shouldn't uh, I think the world would be a better place if everybody was a lot kinder to each other you know what i mean yeah yeah and that's a uh that's a really great uh that's a really great way of of looking um of looking at it and just kind of um embracing uh, embracing everything so so another question i have um for you is um is if if somebody uh, if somebody has a friend with cluttering, then um, th then what, what what advice would you have for uh, for that person? And um, and it's kind of uh, w well, one of the things that I realized about stuttering um, pretty um, pretty recently is is that uh, uh, like like if um, if if there was that question with stuttering, that, then probably my number one thing that I would say about stuttering is don't don't interrupt the person. Um, who's who's stuttering, and and that's something that I uh, that's something that I wouldn't have realized if I hadn't actually talked to uh, talked to people who stutter, um, because uh, uh, because I think um, it, a lot of people that don't that aren't really used to stuttering um, see see this person struggling with their speech and they think oh well I I want to help them out so so I'll like I'll like finish their sentences and stuff but um, but but that's real that for, for stuttering that's really really bad. Um, um, or, or, or maybe not bad, but ju ju just counterproductive, and and can, and can make the person stuttering feel like really, really um, uh, um, feel really, really, really disheartened. And so, so, so I'm wondering, like, like for uh, for for cluttering, uh, uh, for cluttering, it's probably uh, like, like people people interrupt me all the time, and it, and it kind of it kind of bugs me sometimes. But uh, uh, but but it's not like uh, it's not like something that I like think about um, the next day or like later on that day. Um, so. 
Um, so, um, so, so, so I'm wondering if there, if there are things like that, like, uh, like if somebody, if somebody's friend or husband or, 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 or um, has cluttering, then, well, then uh, what, what advice do you have for, uh, for them interacting with the clutter? I think if the person starts to maze too much, you need, it, it can be helpful to sort of try and say, oh, you know, so not necessarily so sort of f focus, you know, focus, you know, get on track. And one of the techniques I, I use is I actually can get you into trouble as well, is I look to the look at the person that I'm speaking to. And if I'm starting to maze, I can often see their facial expression change or or you know they that they, they, they want to sort of uh so, sort of move away get get on get on with something else so one of the things i try and do is plan what i'm going to say sort of think about the message beforehand you know and you know if i am if i've got two or three different things and i get over engrossed on one thing it can be quite handy if the person says so sort of say so it says uh refo it sort of you know refocus you know s stuff like that there's nothing yeah, worth yeah, yeah. Getting, getting lost in a maze and somebody not not uh so it, it, it can be helpful i know that people you know i've worked out that a lot of people who who stutter it's actually really difficult for them and they certainly don't need you to try and finish their bloody sentences. I mean, that's that's out that's out of that's out of order. So if somebody's trying to say something and you think you already know it. No, of course you don't. Uh, I also think maybe that uh, people who uh, stutter don't need to be looked at or. I mean, the worst thing you can do to anybody with a communication impairment is is bully them because of it. I really don't think that's appropriate. You know, it's it's yeah. not it's not helpful. It doesn't help, and you know, that's more of a problem for you than it is than it is for them. It's going to be their problem if you make them feel terrible. So you shouldn't. And of course maybe that's one of the things that happened to me is that because of the misdiagnosis uh of a, of a minor speech situational speech impediment and if you look at it the way i dealt with it was actually to change the system so you know in the end may may maybe if i'd have been given the space and listened to all I ever wanted to do was look after my make sure my children had the help they needed uh I never expected to go on uh quite such an odyssey and change a little bit of psychiatry as much I didn't I, I didn't ask for that you know I wanted to you know I didn't ask to get PTSD all I asked for my, was for my children to get the help they needed. And in the end, I suppose that if you think if you think about people who clutter, the, mo the majority of the time, it's no big deal. Uh, I think it's important to give people the space, the space they need and you know hopefully i've helped i've helped do that help i think if you notice somebody with a uh, speech disorder like cluttering it can also act as a social lubricant if in a way because you can sort of you know you should sort of introduce yourself and sort of say that you've got some similar difficulties and you know you can sort of mention about some of the you know the uh 
sort of associated disorders. And what I do is because obviously I've had to fight uh, a number of legal battles uh, associated uh, well, over my children's education. Uh, what I have done is I've developed a, a number of internet friends and also personal friends uh, from when I've noticed features uh, associated with cluttering and and or associated with uh, autism stroke learning difficulties. So what we've actually done is we've actually become a support group for each other, if that makes sense. And I think I I think I think that's I I I, I think that's a good thing. You know, I've got friends of well over 20 years standing. My children are 26 now, uh, my oldest children. And there's people I've known for over 20 years and remain friends with. So, you know, I think, I, I think we're an interesting community, you know, uh, a tribe. I think there's a book called Neuro Tribes, isn't there? Uh, I think we're, I think we're, uh, Steve Silverman wrote, wrote it. It uh, won a few awards. Uh, it's about autism, but I think, I think we're also a, I think we're also a community and I'm sure we've all got our separate strengths. You know, I'm the, I'm the man who noticed, uh, noticed and, and researched his communication disorder and then took that communication disorder, thought about how it could be mixed up with other things. And I think that's really quite a, quite an interesting thing. It should uh, hopefully help a lot of people who, who have got a communication disorder, get the help they need rather than being shoved down a route, you know, which, uh, you know, if you get diagnosed with bipolar disorder, it has quite profound uh, ramifications. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I, I, I think, I, 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 th I think that, uh, you know, it needs, I think clinicians, medical clinicians need to be aware of the communication disorder. It was discovered in 1964, a year before I was born, with vice. Uh, it, it was sort of mentioned way before that. I forget what the, the, the guy's name was. It was a sort of vaguely sort of uh, Scandinavian sounding name. So I think I think clinicians need to be aware of uh, communication disorders, particularly higher level communication disorders uh, in in settings. And I also think the same applies to teachers uh, so that they, you know, if they notice a child with a communication disorder, they should think that maybe there could be some other learning difficulties there uh as well so you know you can get uh i can i can get quite bolted out if there's way too much into it, it i almost said it then almost uh, i almost said intervention instead of in information you know if there's too much information and it's presented way too quick to me i can miss stuff out or not take it in or realize, or, or realize the the uh, interrelationship between it, and that in itself uh, can can cause some difficulties. You know, I can uh, get hold of the wrong end of the stick, misunderstand what people are trying to say. So I think I, th I think there's a whole lot of very subtle stuff uh, as 
as as well uh, with uh, associated uh, communication communication and learning difficulties and social difficulties. I think there's a whole. I I, I think I think it's a lot more subtle. So for help, maybe maybe. Maybe I would say, you know, you should draw people's attention to uh, uh, attention to it and explain how it can be associated with other difficulties, and if necessary, uh, point them uh, point them in the right in the right direction and give them a little bit of understanding and empowerment. Uh, so yeah. There's an awful lot of things. There's an awful lot of things associated with our our communication disorder. So. Yeah, and um, and and um, and that's um, that, uh, that's really interesting about um, like um, like like helping them um, uh, helping them in that way. And I and I really like what you said about uh, amazing because um, because I've noticed uh, like, like like for me, kind of adding a little bit to your to your answer. One of the things that helps me a lot um, when I'm amazing or just going off on a whole bunch of different topics is um, is um, sometimes a friend of mine will say, "So, so how does that relate back to?" And then they describe what um, they they describe what I was what, what we were talking about before. So like, oh, and so so how does that relate to um, to to what we had for lunch um, yesterday? Um, and then. Uh, and then, and then that kind of forces me to realize, oh well, I said this, that went to this, that went to this, that went to this, and um, and uh, and then um, and, and then if if they say it that way, and and say the topic that they want me to relate it to, then that helps me to say, oh, to say either, oh, uh, yeah, it kind of doesn't, or well, well, it relates to that because of this and this, and and I was. And and I better hurry up and make my point. Um, so, um, so that can be uh, uh, that, that can be really helpful. And then um, and then I, I also notice that when I'm amazing, then I a lot of times just get like too much in my head, and and I and I kind of can't remember what we were talking about only like two two minutes ago. So, so something else that really helps me when I'm amazing is if I um, if I just um, if I if I just like look like I forgot everything, instead of the instead of the person taking that as a cue to move on, if if the person says, oh well, you you, you were talking about, and then kind of remind me of the general subject of what we're talking about, then, then I've noticed that then I noticed that that helps a lot too. So um, so so I'm really glad that you brought up uh, amazing because uh, be, because it's not necessarily like the um, it's not necessarily the repetitions that bother me and and the bother. And the bother you, I think it's more. Um, it's more that if we have like a whole bunch of jumble of thoughts, then uh, 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 then it um, th th then a listener can kind of help to um, guide us in the um, guide us in the way where we can be more more cohesive with uh, with, with everything. Um, so so I think we're um, I think we're about out of time. But um, uh, but but do you have any final um, do you have any final um, thoughts or anything that we didn't cover? Um, yet that you wanted to um, cover any any final things to say? Uh, I think that one of the things that uh, is interesting is the way that having discovered the language disorder is that it helped me it, it helped uh some of the other clinicians cl clinicians that i've dealt with dispel uh uh get rid of a diagnosis of uh bipolar disorder and uh go down to the go uh down to the uh ptsd uh diagnosis because i think unless you if you're inter interviewing a patient uh, with cluttered speech, you have to be very careful to structure structure the interview, and I think that can be really important. So I I, I think that's important, and I think it's also quite interesting the way you say 
how us lot can sort of maze and go off on tangents. It's, uh, it, I think that's quite, you know, I, I, I think certainly in a work situation, it uh, can cause some difficulties, you know? So I, th I, I think I, I think the way people sort of say, you know, you know, get get back to where you, you know get get back on topic is 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 is, is quite is, is is quite interesting. So, I mean, we've I know I've I've made and we've you know we've gone through a hell of a lot of things like. Uh, soft clothes and sort of a whole load of sort of really weird stuff but i'm sure that that anybody listening to this might think yeah i can sort of understand a little bit more about myself now and you know some any clinician listening to it would probably think yeah well maybe we should be looking uh for a more functional assessment uh, for our patients with sort of sen with, with, with sensory and organisational uh, and other stuff, because you have to remember that uh, the communication disorder is only one part of a person. It's you know there's a there's a hell of a lot more to us than there's a hell of a lot more to us than that. And I think the other thing, interesting thing about it is, shall I, uh, I know it's going to sound most peculiar when I said, there's quite a few people with cluttered speech who've got some pretty damn clever ideas, you know? It's, uh, it, it's, it, it's, uh, quite it's quite interesting. So I think the, you know, once I discovered it, uh, and I was able to put it into context, it led to, you know, it led to, it's, it's led to some quite interesting uh, stuff. And I'm pretty, pr pr pretty, pretty sure uh, that, you know, if clinicians take it into account, it, sh it, sh it sh should help people get the help, help they need. So I think that, uh, what they need to do is when they're training doctors is I think they need to have probably an afternoon on uh, cluttered speech and associated disorders so that that they structure structure stuff which can mean that which can help people and I also think that uh, teachers should be be more aware of the difficulties that can occur as it, with uh, with uh, cluttered speech, so that 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 they're sort of you know, so that there's sort of little flags come up saying, well, you know, if this person's got cluttered speech, could there be other other things associated with it, you know? Uh, in a in a teaching and a clinical environment, and also in a work environment, because you might well find that person's got a hell of a lot of special skills. You know, it's it, it's an it, it, it's a, it's an interesting condition, but I think that uh, maybe people should watch a little bit of Eric Morecambe as well, and you know, just accept it just just for what it is it's just uh yeah you know, it, it it's it's just there it's you know it's 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 not it, it's not it's not going to kill you and it just might make a few people uh laugh with you you know you know I, you know as i said william the concrete did build quite a few castles you know yeah oh, yeah uh, you know, I'd have loved to have, I'd have loved to have, uh, have had that because that was that was really that was uh, really quite amusing. Because of course I was thinking about all the castles that he built, and it just turned into something totally different. You know, and again I'm probably amazing a bit. But we were talking about our parents. You know, it was just 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 something really peculiar.
you know? Yeah. So, so, um, thanks. Um, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. You, um, you, you covered quite a few things that I haven't ever considered before. And, um, and, and I, um, I'm, I've read, I've read lots and lots of stuff on cluttering. So it was really, it's really cool to talk to you because you, um, you, you just have a really cool, a, a really cool perspective that, um, that, um, that, that, that I've learned. And you've opened up my mind a lot. And, and then I especially, um, I, I especially think that the stuff that you said about bipolar is really important because, um, because you made the point that if, someone if someone got the wrong diagnosis of bipolar that could really drastically change their quality of life uh, when uh, uh, when it doesn't need to so um, so um, so I think that's um, I, um, I think that's really really important what um, what, uh, what you said and, um, and and it's really really cool to talk to you this is uh, this is our first time talking uh, like in person even though we've chatted a lot over um, um, over uh, um, over the years and um, and so it's just really cool uh, it's re it, it's really cool to do this. So so um, thank you um, thank you again very very much for for doing this interview with me. Well, it's it, it's nice it, it it's nice to meet you uh, in 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 person, and I'm sure what we'll probably do is we'll probably uh, probably sometime I'll, I'll have to uh, send to you. Uh, some of the, well, you're pretty, you're pretty internet savvy. You'll have to have a look at some of the stuff on the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists uh, website uh, about uh, disfluency. And if the other thing that might be quite interesting is if you have a look at the government green paper uh, written by a chappie called Judge on uh, speech and language disorders in childhood and how that can affect affect children uh, as as well. So what we'll do offline is if you whack me your uh, email over, I'll scan some stuff and, uh, and send it Send, send it down to you. I'm doing quite a lot of work at the moment in Cumbria uh, with the education review for special educational needs on uh, and we're, we're sort of doing some of the stuff to do with uh, mental uh, mental me mental health in children and speech and the interrelationship with communication disorders and it's it, it's funny really that how I can reflect back on some of the difficulties I had with my own uh, education uh, my child my children's and also the knowledge that I can bring to the table in helping some of the managers and healthcare professionals because so many people don't have the more specialized they become in sort of speech and language therapy and stuff like that is they often uh, miss miss you know the the the, the little bits of the, what was it i described them as oh yeah i said that i'm a bit of an elephant yeah and all the people who've talked to me have have been blind and they've only grabbed a hold of a little bit of it yeah so you often you, you 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 know and i'm able to take this more generalized view of uh communication disorders uh and developmental, uh, you know, edu uh, and special educational needs and mental health and all the rest of it. Because obviously, if you've got a, a kiddie who's got a stutter or he's, he's got some features of cluttering, and he's going through school, he, there's a whole load of different things that he might he might 
he might well have. And one of the people that I've been working with has got a daughter with cluttered speech who's getting in her into her teens. And her speech uh, disorder was never recognised. They knew there was something there, but it was never recognised. And I was able to talk to mum, talk about my own, and she was able to say, ah, that's what's been happening with my daughter, you know? So th there's a, you know, I think we're stronger as a group. And I think being open about it can help, help a lot of other people. And I think, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that the stuff that we'll do offline will, will make you think about a whole load of different things. But do you know what I'd really like to do? Yeah? Is go out for a beer and have some decent decent Thai food and have a bloody good time, you know? Yeah. You know, so, just uh, just, just, uh, just uh, avoid, uh, avoid the clutter and just be, no, just, just, just uh, you know, do the normal stuff. Yeah, so after um, after the after the pandemic, you'll have to come to Thailand and I'll... Um, I've got to look up, I've, it's US. one of the places I want to visit. Uh, um, cool. my, wife, my wife's a vegetarian, I know the Thais do some really good vegetarian food, the kings of tofu, uh, and, uh, you know, I want to see my sister's kid out in Thailand, and, you know, it sounds like an interesting uh, country. The, you know, the world is your lobster, yeah. not oyster. Uh, um, cool. So, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up um, uh, now. So, so th um, thanks uh, um, thanks again for uh, thanks again for doing this, and um, and then we'll and then we'll chat offline. So, so thank you, thank you very much. Take good care and have a uh, ha have a good have a good day. The sun's just fallen where I am, so uh, yeah, uh, I'm seeing the dark through the window, and it's it's uh, sort of proper winter it's january and we've had a whole load of snow and all the rest of it and you're you're you're, you're probably complaining about the fans that you need <laughs> yeah okay um, um good night then